Welcome to the Falcon and the Winter Soldier review. In this review, if I spoil anything, I will warn verbally before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. And otherwise, the only spoilers will be for earlier entry entries in this franchise. So, plot. After being handled, handed the mantle of Captain America at the end of Avengers Endgame, Sam Wilson teams up with Bucky Barnes in a worldwide adventure, puts their abilities to the test as they fight the anarchist group, the Flag Smashers. The Flag Smashers are yet another MCU villain who has a very noble idea, it's very complex and easy to empathize with, identify with, other than how far they go to achieve their goals. Carly, in some ways, the leader of the Flag, Flag Smashers, Carly Morgenthal, in some ways, she is very reminiscent of Steve Rogers in a show that's all about the legacy of Steve Rogers, who will take over for him. At points, you find yourself wondering if Steve would, if Steve were still around, would he be fighting the Flag Smashers or join them and try to lead them in more peaceful methods? They believe things were better during the blip. They want a world unified without borders. Which does make a lot of sense. Borders do lead to a lot of problems. It's absurd to refuse refugees seeking asylum. I do personally believe that removing borders would lead to problems. Now, you know, it's possible that the pandemic has led to an increase in belief that order that borders should be removed. And certainly, a lot of people have been very critical of how their own government has handled the pandemic. And a lot of that frustration is completely fair. Since a number of governments were much too slow to implement restrictions that saved lives. Now, yeah, so for a while, at least a number of people weren't quite sure exactly what it was about life during the blip that the Flag Smashers thought was good and worth recreating. I'm going to go ahead and say something that isn't told right at the start of the show. If you don't want to know, you can skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. So this is a, yeah, so during the blip, because there were 50% less people in the world, and the following is a monologue by Carly Mogenthal, for five years people have been welcomed into countries that used to keep them out with barbed wire. There were jobs, people were happy to let them in. It was the entire world coming together, and then boom, just like that, it goes right back to the way it used to be end of monologue, so they are basically motivated by how badly refugees and immigrants in general are treated. Carly basically points out that quite a few countries, perhaps most of them, will treat immigrants and same word minorities who were born in the country to that as nothing more than temporarily useful. And the moment that these people are no longer seen as an asset, they're seen as a problem, something, something to get rid of, and that is sadly exactly how many countries feel. Basically, if you aren't the same ethnicity as the people who run the country, then you're seen as less deserving of basic human rights than by people who are the same ethnicity. And sadly, many times this goes beyond simply taking care of those people's needs. Before minorities, many times they will only take care of those people even when there is enough resources to help the minorities as well. Thor Ragnar also had a lot of empathy for refugees, and in general this is yet another instance of the MCU pointing out very real problems in the world, trying to get the people who could help fix these problems to show more empathy. No more spoilers for the show for the time being. While I personally did not have a problem with the amount of plot there was in WandaVision, some people did feel like it was too little, and I think a lot of those people will think there is plenty of plot in this one, because there is a lot. The trailers did definitely not give everything great in the show away. The shared continuity continues to be a great asset for the MCU. And yeah, so global, this is a global espionage thriller, and the music and locations really hammer home how international it is. This is not just a bunch of sets. The show is extremely bingeable. I rewatched episodes one through five two days before my first viewing of episode six, and it's a great experience. So the various episode plots, they there is an overall continuity, but there are also some plot lines that are specific to only some episodes. And... Something I really greatly appreciate is that 
the good guys on the show do actually discuss, you know, are the flag, you know, what is it that the Flag Smashers, you know, they agree that the Flag Smashers need to stop. They, they have to, you know, the, the Flag Smashers maybe do some things that go too far. I'm not going to give away exactly what. But the, the good guys do talk about, you know, I mean, some of what they're saying makes a lot of sense, you know. I've before said of the MCU that a number of the villains... You agree with their cause, just not their methods. Now, let's see. So, yeah, um, a major theme. I already mentioned, yeah, major theme is how to live up to Steve Rogers' legacy. Who can live up to it? How could they live up to it? And another major theme is that despite their successes in the movies, several hero characters have a hard time perhaps especially with just regular life. They've been let down, left to fend for themselves. They may still fight well, but here we get to see that a lot of their lives, you know, yeah, you get to see a lot of their lives outside of the fighting, and they do have some trouble, and, you know, that's not, that's not going to surprise anyone as far as Bucky goes, but some people might be surprised by how many problems Sam also has. At the very, uh, hmm. yes, at the very start of the show, Falcom and Bucky have both been pardoned for their crimes and are law-abiding citizens. And, let's see, yeah, in, in some ways, this show is like Captain America 2, but without Steve Rogers. Or more of that, not just the same thing, but tonally, it, it has some resemblance to that. And, let's see, so, yeah, the Sokovia Accords do play some role in this show, which, you know, the, the films have not really resolved Civil War, and, yeah, I, th I think that, I'm, I'm not going to give away how much this does, but I do think, you know, there's, there's still interesting stories there. I'm glad that they haven't tried to resolve all of it. Now, yeah, so this show explores what the blip was like and long-term consequences of them. In some ways, it is similar to how Corona has changed the real world, although, of course, when they first created the show, they didn't know all of the specific details of how Corona lockdown would affect the world. Now, let's see. Yeah, when, when the concept itself appearing in Infinity War and Endgame, they didn't know that Corona would happen at all. But, yeah, you know, it's it's wild. I, I don't know if they're going to, both WandaVision and this show, like, there's there's definitely, there are, there are some aspects of Corona that you can really, that, that uh, have, yeah, some stuff in the, that happen in the shows that make you think about Corona in a certain, yeah. Everything about this feels like the scope of a blockbuster movie. Filming, direction, action, editing, acting, writing. It's like if several Captain America movies was released right after each other. It doesn't feel the way TV shows used to feel. Another really big difference between this and the way TV shows feel is that TV shows are basically constantly trying to make sure that you are not tempted to change the channel when there's a commercial break. Some shows do a good job with this. I maintain that Prison Break is great, but for a lot of shows, it could feel awkward how the plot has to have something major really frequently, especially right before an ad break. On this show, the pacing allows them to dive into subjects that they can then explore properly without constantly trying to rush ahead so that the ad break doesn't lure you away. And Really, the the pacing. I think of all the of all the MCU properties so far, this is probably the one that is the very most comfortable with just letting characters talk, like discuss ideas. There doesn't have to be something big constantly, and. 
I'm sure some people thought that it that they went too far with how much of it is talking, but I would personally say I, I didn't think I would. I if you had told me before I started watching, a lot of it's just going to be talking. Like you watch the trailers, and it does kind of look like it's going to be nonstop action, but you know I mean I knew because they talked about it in interviews and such, but there is a lot of talking on this in the show, and it does really. It works. You know, we care about these characters. We care about the situation that we're seeing them in. And, yeah, it, it does not feel like the... Like they're worried that you're gonna stop watching. This show goes into how America treats the people who fight for it in military and such. Not protecting them once they need... Yeah. Once they need that. Let's see. Yeah, so this is going to sound like a tangent, but I swear I'm going to bring it back to. Yeah, I love several of the X-Men movies, and I do think that it's great that we have such an established comic book presence that comments on negative treatment of minorities, be it LGBTQ, ethnic, etc., Something that a number of people have, yeah, and I do briefly want to say, it is extremely important that we empathize with, yeah, minorities. Something that a number of people have criticized in those movies is that it's not a perfect metaphor, since as bad as the treatment of mutants in X-Men stories is, it's easy to understand at least some of the people who fear them, since they're so powerful, far more powerful than people who are not mutants. And part of that is probably, you know, the, 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 com the comics were written to empower people who feel alone. But it does also make the, you know, that, that meta a, a weaker metaphor, since comparatively we cannot say that people who are, you know, LGBTQ and ethnic minorities are not more dangerous than people who are white, straight, and cis. That just isn't a thing. You know, it's, for sure there are people who think that they are, but there's no, there's no real basis in reality of that. Now, some of the comics, especially dealing with other versions of Captain America than Steve Rogers, including Isaiah Bradley, make for a better metaphor. If Captain America was black, even though he did something incredible, he would still be treated as badly as many black people are by the American government and a number of just racist citizens, that is sadly 100% true. Tons of black people who were innocent or heroic have been abused by police and other government forces, so it's really nice to see the MCU confront that. It brings up, you know, this show brings up and comments on police brutality, aggressive U.S. foreign policy, the, the depiction, the, the coverage, media coverage of police brutality, and one of the themes of the show is symbols, the power they hold, the value they have, and the danger they can also represent if misused or trusted in too much. And obviously, the title of Captain America and the shield make up one of those symbols. So along, over, you know, over the course of the show, the, you know, Bucky and Sam will try to you know, try to find the Flag Smashers and stop them, and they will also have to investigate what led to the, you know, where did the Flag Smashers come from? And the, I think that's, yeah, that's what I'm gonna see for the, for that aspect. Now, as far as writing goes, <clears throat> So, yeah, some of the following is just going to be straight from Wikipedia. Yeah, this is one of the shows, you know, and one of the MCU-based Disney Plus shows to be centered on supporting characters from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, films who had not starred in their own films. And, let's see, yeah, so there are six episodes total, and... Yeah, with a hefty budget rivaling those of a major studio production. And 
yeah, it's it's produced by Marvel Studios rather than Marvel Television, which produced previous television series in the MCU, the Netflix shows, for example. And I want to say ABC shows, was there, was there more than one? I think there was more than one. And, you know, and including the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige was believed to be taking a hands-on role in each series development, focusing on continuity of story with the films and handling the actors who would be reprising the roles from the films. Malcolm Spellman was hired to write a limited series that focused on Sam Wilson and Bucky Barnes. At the end of October 2018, Mackie and Stan had both previously expressed interest in starring in an MCU spin-off together, with Stan comparing the potential idea to buddy comedy films like Midnight Run and 48 Hours, which it very much... Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of Midnight Run going on in the, the relationship between Sam and Bucky. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I have watched 48 Hours. I know, I know, I will get to it. And... Yeah, so the series begins after the film Avengers Endgame, which depicts Steve Rogers bequeathing his shield on the mantle of Captain America to Wilson. Mackie clarified that Wilson did not agree to being Captain America in Endgame, and Falcon and Winter Soldier walking the line of who's going to take up the shield, who's going to be Captain America if Steve isn't coming back. Derek Kolstad joined the series writing team in July 2019, said he would be bringing a wink and a nod to the style of world building and character development from his film franchise, John Wick. Colstead felt the series taking secondary characters from the films and putting them in primary roles resulted in them becoming cooler, more interesting, adding their small humanity, more longing, more suffering, and coming to grips with who and what they are. Additionally, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier features some characters from the earliest Marvel films. They've been layered and reinvented in a way that's going to shift the storytelling story structure. Colstad added that the series would explore reactions to a black man becoming Captain America. Spellman wanted to go home with the characters and let the actors show their skills rather than simply focus on action in the series. Stands that the series tone is similar to that of Captain America and Winter Soldier. Explaining that the series is grounded and very much in the world as we know it, he added that being able to explore the characters over six hours with the series gave them so much more mileage and allowed the characters to be in new situations that would not be possible in a two-hour film. 100% true. Feige stated that though the series is set in the MCU, it's more of a reflection of the real world. Considering it was written in 2019, it has only become more relevant and more poignant for our time. And yeah, so back to my own notes. I have to wonder if they're talking about the rise of right-wing extremism. Certainly the new government-sanctioned version of Captain America, John Walker, is celebrated at a football game, playing the, you know, where... Yeah, playing. They they play the national anthem at those, and conservatives freak out if the players take a knee during it instead of standing for it. And the yeah, in in the I'm not giving away anything from the show. This is in the trailer, and it's not a spoiler anyway. During the celebration of you know on the show, John Walker even high fives a smiling black man. Now on the field, you know, conservatives love hiding behind individual members of the minorities that they vilify. Trevor Walker can't be anti-black. Look, he's celebrating with a black guy. He might even let him use his bathroom. The MCU continues to show just how incredibly clever the people behind it are. This is the first time that a new character takes over the actual title of another character. Sure, they recast Rhodey and Banner. They haven't seen Elizabeth Ross since The Incredible Hulk. But this is the first time that the actual superhero title is moved from one character to another. And this is Captain America, one of the most popular of the heroes. Regardless of who exactly replaced Steve Rogers, there would be a substantial chunk of the fans who would say, this guy doesn't deserve to be the new Captain America. So they make it a significant plot point that even in-universe characters don't think this guy should be the new Captain America, even though some aspects of his character show that he understands the significance and how important it is for Captain America to be a positive role model. And let's see.
yeah so the yeah so so on the on one of the trailers right at the polygon set the trailer certainly delivered and felt the series was similar in scope to an mcu film so the while the trailer did not have many hints to the broader mcu it did showcase the old and new villains of the series zemo and the flag smashers and the trailer promises explosive action jet setting plot some very creepy villains and best of all a return of the characters odd couple Best Frenemies Dynamic from Captain America Civil War. And... Yeah, and, and you know, I, I'm i afraid I didn't write down who they were interviewing, but on a interview that's on YouTube, I think it might, excuse me, I think it might be one of the writers said that the heroes and villains, you know, on, on this show, both the heroes and villains perceive themselves to be heroes, and the heroes understand, you know, the, the points of view of the villains. I really appreciate the immense emotional intelligence of the show. The show handles plot twists excellently, and some twists were not in the trailers. There are, there are twists in this that you, you know, you might be able to guess before it shows up in the show itself based on what you've seen, you know, based on some episodes of the show. But when you start watching this show, you are not going to know all the... There, there are a bunch of things that were not in any of the trailers. And it is an... You know, the, the pilot of this is extremely strong. It does an incredible job setting up the overall plot, subplots, the various characters who are extremely important. And the finale is also incredible. I, I acknowledge that not everyone agrees with me on this, but I was personally completely satisfied with the handling and resolutions of the plot lines and characters. The, the finale wraps up everything that it needs to. Some things are completely resolved. Other things are left with an opportunity to continue that plot elsewhere. And that is, you know, yeah, that's one of the things we love about the MCU. It's not just one movie at a time. They have plans. And, uh, yeah, like I said for the, for if WandaVision, some of the things that happen on this show are going to be reflected in the movies. So if you don't watch the show at all, or at least read, like, what happened on the show, you might be really confused in some of the upcoming MCU movies. So the... Let's see. Yeah. So, on to the characters. We all remember that Sam told Spider-Man not to talk so much during their fight. I had honestly forgotten he says the exact same thing to Scott Lang and Ant-Man. He just in general finds it annoying when he's fighting a young guy who's overly eager and talks a lot during the fight. Or in the case of Paul Rudd, not actually that young. He's 52. He still looks that young. He's actually older than Anthony Mackie is. And... Yeah, one of, you know, one of the things is Sam is trying to help out his sister. The writing is incredibly authentic. You can tell that at least some of the people writing the relationship between Sam... Yeah, Sam, his sister Sarah, and her kids actually are black and have experience with, you know, how... Yeah, the, the family dynamics of, you know... Spoiler alert, they're not exactly like white families. There are, there are some dynamics that are slightly different. And I really appreciate that the show isn't, like, trying... It's it's not backing away from that. It's not scared to, you know... They're, if they backed away from it, it might imply that they think that black people's interpersonal relationships are lesser than those of white people, and that's just not true. The, they're different in some ways, but they're not... They're not inherently worse. And the, it's also very clear that the, the people writing it have experience with how you're treated in America if you're black and not rich. Let's see. Yeah, and the relationships between family members for struggling black people. And let's And yeah, you know, the, I, I really appreciate that this is not afraid to show, you know, the, the, let's be honest, I love the MCU, but let's be honest, it's pretty heavy on straight white cis dudes. Almost all of them are American, and 
English is their first language, you know. So I, I really appreciate that here we have some, you know, that, yeah, the show is asking you to empathize with black people. Not every scene has a white guy that you can recognize yourself in if you're not black. And the show isn't afraid that, you know, I'm sure that some people did, you know, stop watching once they realize that, although, you know, not the amount that, yeah, some, some, some conservative claim that, like, uh, what was it, 90-something percent turned away because there was a scene with racial profiling, profiling. that's almost definitely not true. I, I don't know how he, would, how, how he would even know that, you know, I, I guess if he worked for, for Disney and was looking at their numbers, but other than that, I don't know how he's supposed to be able to tell that, but, yeah, I can imagine that there, there might have been some people who didn't watch because you're asked to empathize with black people, but that's, you know, the, if, if you only ever make the safe decision when you're making art, creative expression, I know not everybody likes it, when stuff like this is referred to as art, when you make creative expression, if you only make the safe decisions, you're never going to challenge people's views. And at the end of the day, you know, Maybe you tolerated the black people in the other movies because the lead was always white. At this point, you have to choose. And, you know, are you going to keep watching something if one of the protagonists is black? If there are scenes with nary a white man to be found? Or are you going to give up on the MCU? Which, I mean, I suppose there, there are people up there who haven't watched all of it. But if you're, like, 20-some movies deep into a cinematic universe... I can imagine you might just, you know, grit your teeth and bear it. And I, yeah, I really appreciate that they did that. They, they could very easily have rewritten those scenes, but it would have made those scenes weaker. It would have made the show as a whole weaker. And... Yeah, there, you know, there are a number of non-whites both in front of and behind the camera. There are positive role models who are not white men. And... Yeah, and, and yeah, some of the characters on the show are written and acted partially based on, for example, a black woman. And shows their strengths. Strengths that among us, you know, white men don't have. I will, you know, colorblind casting does also have some strengths, but I really appreciate that this use, uses color conscious cast, casting instead. Uh, you know, the, the trends might have you thinking that the show is about men from America, mostly white ones, fighting off scary foreigners. Let's be honest, it's not like the MCU has never done that. But this actually has good guys and bad guys that are white, that aren't male, female, it's not really about pointing fingers and saying this person is good, this person is evil. It, you know, it's, it says that the American government lets its citizens down, and it's important to hold them to account for that, and that it is important to treat refugees humanely. Now, yeah, so Sam is... His... his you know, his his suit looks, you know, closer to a Captain America, you know, uniform with colors and and some of the some of the design, but it's still, you know, it, it's from the very start of the show, and that's again not a spoiler. It's in the first scene of the first episode. You you kind of get the sense that he's maybe approaching it, but he's not quite comfortable with just diving into a kind of, yeah. I had honestly forgotten that Sam, sorry, that's what apologizing to, Anthony Mackie played Papa Doc in 8 Mile in, in 2002. It's, it's been almost two decades since B-Rabbit asked him, tell these people something they don't know about me. We're still waiting. And... Yeah, so Sebastian Stan as Bucky Barnes, Winter Soldier. I really love how the two of them can't really stand each other. Like, or actually, not can't really, really can't 
stand each other. First, they were fighting each other in Captain America the Winter Soldier, and again, briefly in Civil War, which obviously is hard to forgive mind control notwithstanding. Then they had to work together since then, and I have to wonder how, you know, we have to wonder how well are they going to get along now that Steve isn't there to keep them from fighting each other. Basically, both of them feel like they're, they themselves are not the other one, is the best friend of Steve Rogers, um, a person who they both care deeply about. Basically, Bucky feels like he's the better friend to Steve since he's known him longer. He was there when he was a skinny little kid. But Falcon feels like he's a real friend. You know, a real friend wouldn't have tried to kill his best friend. You know, they both have felt like the other is trying to steal Steve away from them. And now both of them have to try to live up to his legacy and continue protecting the world. Now, let's see. And I will... I'm not going to give away exactly how, but the... Yeah, the, the show does bring up when Steve handed Sam the shield in Endgame and that whole decision. That is something that gets brought up in the show. You're not expected to just forget. You know, there are people who think that it would have made more sense for him to give the shield to Bucky. And I would say that the reason why he didn't is something that the show does a really great job of communicating. So I'm not going to give it away here. If you've been watching my thoughts on videos for the individual episodes, you already know. And, you know, obviously given how badly they get along a lot of the time, you know, a question that needs answering is why do they continue working together? I would say that the answer is that, you know, the, the, There aren't that many people left that they could work with to stop the Flag Smashers, and the Flag Smashers are going to be difficult to stop, even, even for the two of them. You know, you, you might wonder, can they now become friends? May they now become friends? And, you know, the, it's, it's possible that they'll be working together with someone else that, you know, the, the, yeah, someone else from the MCU, and I'm not going to give away who, but, yeah, you know, the, the Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, and Wanda, you know, are basically, yeah, can, can try to help out each other, Hawkeye has retired. Ant-Man has help from his supporting cast. Thor, the Guardians, and such have gone back to space. So, yeah, other, you know, Bucky and Falcon are some of the only ones who can still really, yeah, work together to stop the Flag Smashers. And... I... Yeah, you know... Bucky and Falcon are two of the only military veterans left that are major MCU heroes, and ultimately, they can work together. They supplement each other really well. You know, obviously, they're not entirely on the same level. Bucky is a lot stronger and faster. Falcon can fly. But it's not like one of them is Vision or Thor, hugely overpowered compared to the other. And... You know, we yeah. So we already knew that Falcon and Bucky had great chemistry together, and this show this show uses that very well. I mean, it seems like they're always going to be at odds. Could they possibly ever become real friends? Well, never say never. Please disregard the fact that I just said it twice. Maybe that can means that they cancel each other out. Does that mean always? Now. Since the MCU so far has had the male heroes display positive traits for men to emulate, you know, I had already guessed, and I was from correctly. This show, you know, keeps that it keeps up that theme. It's, I know, some people say I take too many shots with 
Zack Snyder, so I'll try to make this the only one I take in this video. Under Zack Snyder, the DCEU really did not... The, the men were incredibly toxic, and, you know, without him, or at least with less input by him, as of Wonder Woman 1, and keeping in mind, I have not watched... Zack Snyder's cut of the, that was a way too long way to say that, Zack Snyder's Justice League or Wonder Woman 1984. Now, Bucky is having PTSD nightmares, horrified at the people he killed when under Hydra control, and he's, you know, he's in therapy, he's trying to make amends, and the therapy is actually part of the pardon that he has received. But, yeah, he's making amends like a recovering alcoholic. But because the stuff he did to hurt people was super soldier stuff, and him, his way of making amends is not exactly the typical 12-step kind of thing. And, yeah, the, this miniseries does continue the intelligent exploration of Bucky's pain. Not a surprise, but still good to hear and see. And the show continues from Captain Wreck 2 to deal with real-life veterans' issues. PTSD, trouble re-entering society. You know, in, in part for, you know, someone like Bucky who hasn't been part of society for a long time. Finances. Basically, Bucky can't escape his past no matter how much he would love to. And Daniel Gruel as Baron Helmut Zemo and... Yeah, really loving to see him back, and there are some, in some ways he's depicted differently than in Civil War. I really loved the, the changes they made, but not, you know, some, some people felt that it was too far removed, and yeah, I, I think that, you know, they, 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 took, they took a chance, and I think it paid off. Other people don't think so. And Emily Van Camp as Sharon Carter. And yeah, so again, briefly reading from Wikipedia. Van Camp said that Carter has been on the run since she was last seen in Civil War, and the series would show what she has been doing in that time. And yeah, and you know, in the trailers, we also see that she gets some good action scenes. She really didn't get very much action in Captain America 2 or 3. And that's really not her fault. You know, Captain America 2, she and Crossbones are in the same room. Both are trying to, you know, she, she's threatening him with a gun. He's threatening the the locked and stock full of people, shield operative guy. She doesn't get to take out Crossbones. He briefly slashes her arm with a knife, and then he runs away, and Sam starts fighting him. And Captain America 3, she's one of the people who try to stop the mind-controlled Bucky, and of course she can't. You know, Black Panther and Captain America come very close, but nobody else can. It, you know, that's that's really not her fault. But the trailer, in the trailer we see, she does get to take down people, and it's, yeah, it's very compelling. And, let's see, yeah. One of the, I, I like her in this miniseries more than I did in the movies, considering that, you know, okay. Oh, one of the things that I really didn't like about her in the movies was the fact that we were supposed to want her to end up with Steve, even though she's related to Peggy. I realize that that wasn't revealed in the MCU in Captain America 2, but it was on Wikipedia. Obviously, I'm not complaining about the fact that they also don't have chemistry, since I don't want them to be together. But I do also just want to point out they did have no chemistry, and, you know, to a much lesser extent, what I didn't like about her was how little she got to do in Captain America 2. But I will say... You know, when I reviewed Captain America 2 back in 2014, I said that there was a, there were too many characters, and I would have removed her character. I am now glad that she, you know, that's, the MCU is really good at redeeming. It's, you know, we're also getting the actual Mandarin in the... Shanti is apparently how Kevin Feige pronounces it, and I'm not saying that I listened to him for absolutely everything, but I'm pretty sure he knows comics better than I do, so I'm, that's the pronunciation I'm going with. But yeah, it's it's wild to see how 
Oh, like Emily Van Camp. I've been watching her since 2000. Yeah, that sounded creepy. I have been watching shows and movies she was in since 2002, including Everwood. And on that show, I would never have guessed. You know, back when I first watched that show, I would not have guessed that she would get, like, really kick-ass action scenes. Like, I would have guessed that she would just be doing, like, I don't know, romantic comedies or something based on the... She was good on Everwood for sure, but it didn't really look like she was angling to be a bigger... Yeah. Now, let's see. I mean, she's one of the only things that I like about The Ring 2. And Wyatt Russell plays John Walker, a militaristic successor to Captain America created by the U.S. government. And the... <laughs> I haven't seen him in very much, but he did play, in, in the 1998 movie Soldier, he played Kurt Russell as a kid, as a kid, which does make sense since he's his kid. And I've long been saying, I love Kurt Russell. So, I'm you know, I was like, if Wyatt has just 10% of his father's charisma and acting talent, I'm sure I'm going to love him. And he has substantially more than 10%. He's incredible. Like, you understand that, like, that's what, yeah, I, no, I, I, yeah, I will say, you really do understand where his character is coming from, and you, you get a real, like, they really humanize him, which I wasn't sure they were going to do, but they do, they do that, and they do such a great job of it, that it is, like, you don't want him to be Captain America, but you're also, like, you, you also don't want him to not be on the show, so it is this kind of, but, yeah, I'm, I am extremely happy with how they handled his character on the show. Same goes for Sam, Bucky, Sarah, Sharon. Now... You know, technically, Kurt Russell, Wyatt Russell's father, plays Ego, the Living Planet, also in the MCU. And, you know, I would like for, like, a character to say, wow, that guy looks just like Ego used to. Because we, you know, yeah, I already mentioned I'm spoiling the other MCU. In... Guardians of the Galaxy 2, we do see a de-aged Kurt Russell, and he does look like Wyatt Russell, so yeah. But, you know, characters, like, the on, on the Venn diagram, characters who know what Ego looks like, and characters who appear on this show, there, there just might not be any overlap, is all I'm going to say. But yeah, for those who don't know the comics... In the comics, John Walker is somewhat like the comedian in Watchmen, or the Captain America of Reagan or Nixon, you know, a tool of the government to, yeah, to be used, not, not, uh, yeah. And George St. Pierre reprises his role as George Batroc, a mercenary master of the French form of kickboxing known as Savate. And... Yeah, I I really loved seeing him again, and yeah, I was very happy with the way they handled him, and yeah, so Aaron Kellyman portrays Carly Morgenthal, the, the, hmm, that's been a spoiler, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna go with a, one of the members of the anarchist anti-patriotism group, the Flag Smashers. She's easy to empathize with, and she has the kind of charisma that is necessary to inspire and carry her th that kind of movement, you know, considering how many people op oppose them, including entire countries and their militaries. So I really appreciate that she's, young. she's not just this, you know, th there, there was a long time where basically... It was believed that if you're making a movie or a comic or something that could hypothetically be read by, 
you know, children are teenagers. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't think I would let a child watch. There are at least parts of the show that I would not want a child to watch. But if you're like 13 or older, sure, sure. But it, it, uh, yeah. For, for movies and, and comics and such, if a child might watch it, then you can't make the villain be appealing. You have to have the villain be just unbearably, just, uh, you know, impossibly evil, not charismatic at all. Everybody hates them. And that would not work for the show at all. And I'm glad that they, they realized that. Like, there are scenes where the Flag Smashers, like, they don't even come across particularly being the bad guys. You know, you, you know that some of the things they do are evil, but yeah, in some scenes, they're just, you know, they're treating other people really well. And they, you know, they clearly care about, you know, innocent people. So, at least some innocent people. And I really appreciate that they didn't try to squeeze all of the content in this miniseries into a, you know, one movie or even two movies. Because there's too much, like, I guess two, two and a half hour movies... Might just barely have all. Or would it be closer to three? I'm I'm not one hundred percent sure exactly how long, but I'm really glad they didn't try to do that. And they 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 do such a good job. Every every episode feels like a full thing. You know, if you if you have been watching this as it was released, you've only been able to watch one episode per week, you know, one new episode per week, and. I'm, you know, I, I really, really love when I can just, I've, I've never been that good at ongoing series. I prefer to just be able to binge watch. And, you know, if you've watched up to this point, I, yeah, I mean, I already mentioned that it's, it, it's a great show to binge watch. But this is a show where I was really excited to see what would happen in the next episode. Every single episode... It's like a gourmet meal, but you no, nobody told you what exactly was going to be in the meal before you started eating, but you knew it was going to it was going to fill you up. It was you know, you every at the end of every episode, I felt like that that was a lot. That was a whole, you know, now I have something I need to process. Maybe it's good that I have a week before I get more of this so that I can really reflect on everything that I just saw. And, yeah, it, it, there, there's no episode, like with WandaVision, there's no episode of this show that just feels like, oh, well, you know, they had to make so and so many episodes, or they had to find some way to handle this. No, everything feels carefully crafted. Now. So the action scenes are a good mix between like quick, tight, and dirty, and grand, carefully choreographed. You know, like again, it feels very much like something out of Captain America Two. And there's actually, you know, some of the Falcons' action is very just cause, very just cause three. You know, if you enjoy the Falcon action, I encourage you to play that game and. If you enjoyed that game, I encourage you to watch the show. And Falcon has new gadgets, new weapons that we haven't seen before, and they're really, really cool. And the show has some of the best action that we've seen in the MCU so far. It's easily on the level of big action blockbusters that make it to theaters. So don't mistake this as made for TV. The action never gets repetitive, despite how much of it involves a lot of the same people, and yeah, you wouldn't think that there would be that much, like, you, you wouldn't think that they could get a lot of variety out of it, but they manage. 
each episode will either have like one really big action scene or several actions, you know, yeah, action scenes spread across the entire episode. There is no episode that has no action. And meanwhile, the plot and character scenes are also deeply compelling. You know, the when Age of Ultron was released, I forget exactly who, but someone said that they would pay to watch these heroes sit around and talk. And, you know, they referred specifically to the, the hammer, you know, the, uh, yeah, the scene early in Age of Ultron where, uh, you know, several Avengers try to lift Mjolnir. And, yeah, I would say this show really does, like, there are scenes of this where it is just they're doing normal day-to-day -day stuff, you know, and it, it humanizes them and it helps... Again, for people who might have, you know, I, I know some people who can watch, like, a show and empathize with the characters, but not empathize with real people who look like the characters on the show. And I think that this show has a very real chance to help close that gap, to make people who... You know, I'm sure that there are people who really get into the black heroes in the MCU, but don't yet connect that to seeing real-life African Americans as equal to white Americans. And, yeah, I, I think this show might help, because we do see that they have some of the same problems. Now... Henry Jackman composes the score for this series after previously scoring Captain America 2 and 3. And in fact, he brings back some of his leitmotifs that he used in those movies to comment on the potential successors to Steve Rogers' legacy, whether or not they're worthy of the shield. And this is matched by some cinematography and editing that is reminiscent of key scenes in those two movies. It's the kind of thing that you can only do with a long-running shared universe, and music is unique to movies and shows. A comic book can at most reference. It can't actually play music. The movies in the MCU have done something similar, but they use it a lot here to really great effect. And, yeah, so the, the there's some buddy comedy jokes, and they do a good job of not making things too silly. You know, I've, I've seen some that... Yeah, they, they do a really great job of taking the the buddy comedy stuff of something like Midnight Run and making it fit in, in something that's this close to reality as, yeah, this show is. Now, as far as violence and blood, this goes a little further than what we've seen in at least some of the other MCU movies, there there are a couple of things in this that are really, really dark. And, yeah, I, I would say, you know, 13 and older than it's, yeah. And, yeah, so the, the you know, tonally, it's similar to Captain Mark II. And... I would say the pacing it kind of goes back and forth. Like, I never found the show boring, but there are definitely some scenes that are a tad more slow that really land before they move on to the next thing. And then, you know, sometimes I've, I've heard some say that some of the action scenes go by too fast and too much happens in too little time. I'm not sure I would personally say I agree with that, but I definitely, I see what they mean, and, you know, there's a chance you, dear viewer, might as well. And, let's see. Yeah, so the, the very best thing about this is how honest and unashamed it is to comment on the, the way that, you know, the American government has treated people that it doesn't consider 
as important and the way that it manages to and 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 the commenting on the 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 way that the American government abandons its veterans when they need some help from the government. Now, let's see. So, if I had to point to something... Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of... I'm not sure I can really think of any genuinely negative thing about the show. Now, I was a little worried that they they wouldn't be able to keep the the overall conflict interesting for all six episodes, but they managed to. And I was especially looking forward to Bucky and Sam together and the commenting on race on veterans' issues and such, and the show exceeded my expectations. I would like to see stuff written and directed, and, you know, filmed and edited by the people who work on this show. I hope that they make something else that I watch. And... Yeah, so... The... Yeah, I already mentioned that the miniseries pilot is great, the miniseries finale is great, the overall season is also great. There, There isn't a single episode that I would be like, like, you know, just a couple of days ago, I rewatched, I, I binge watched the first five episodes, and I wouldn't have skipped one anyway, but I was not sitting there like, ah, uh, now it's this episode. Okay, well, eventually I'll get through it kind of thing. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the binge rewatch for this show as I did the one for WandaVision. Now, let's see. Yeah, sometimes I try to pick one specific episode to really highlight. I don't think I can really do that without spoiling anything. I, I will say, if you watch, like, you know, so some people felt that it wasn't quite enough in the first episode or the second episode. I think the, the third and fourth episodes might be what really s seal the deal for some people. If you're not sold on the first two episodes, try to give it, you know, also episodes three and four. If, if by the end of episode four you don't care about the last two episodes, then it's not it's not for you. And yeah, this is a series that is both entertaining to watch and actually good. I recommend this to anyone who enjoys the MCU, especially people who care a lot about the... <sighs> Yeah, the, the second and third Captain America solo movies. People who care about depictions of race. Like, if you don't know anything about the MCU, then hopefully you haven't been watching all the way up here because I have been spoiling the MCU. But the if you, if you know someone who doesn't yet know the MCU and you think, based on what I've said, you think they'd like the show, I would say it's worth to, you know... I'm not sure there's that much you have to show them I guess okay yeah um, the only way I can say exactly what you have to show them is by spoiling so brief spoiler for the uh, yeah for for this show the stuff you definitely have to show you know someone who is just getting into this miniseries but who you know who yeah, the, the movies that you have to show them. All three Captain America solo movies. The, let's see, Age of Ultron is probably a good idea. I think, yeah, yeah, you probably got to go for the first Avengers. 
and the third and fourth Avengers movies, the Black Panther solo movie. I think that is absolutely everything that... Yes, so, no more spoilers for the time being. Now, yeah, so I... I recommend this to I already rating the rating is what I'm yeah so I give this ten globe trotting espionage thrillers out of ten mm -hmm. this is one of the single best things I've ever watched I really can't wait for more Disney Plus MCU which thankfully it's, I'm not gonna have to wait very long let's see it's not next week but the you know, week after that, Loki starts. So, yeah, really, really psyched that Disney is doing this. And, yeah. I hope this video helped you decide whether or not the show is for you. Hope you enjoyed watching. As I enjoy watching and recording. And I'll catch you next time.